The Zeitgeist Movement Defined, Essay 11, Structural Classism, The State and War, Part 2. Class War, Inherent Psychology. Moving on to the class war, this notion has been noted in historical literature for centuries based partly on assumptions of human nature, partly on assumptions of a lack of capacity of the earth and production means to meet everyone's needs, and partly on the more relevant awareness that the system of market capitalism inevitably guarantees class division and imbalance due to its inherent mechanisms, both structurally and psychologically. Founding free market economist David Ricardo's statement that if wages should rise, then profits would necessarily fall, is a simple acknowledgement of the structural assurance of class conflict as the wage relates to the lower working class and the profits the upper capitalist class, and as one gains, the other loses. Likewise, even Adam Smith, in his canonical The Wealth of Nations, clearly expresses the nature of power preservation on the behavioral, psychological level stating, civil government, so far as it is instituted for the security of property, is in reality instituted for the defense of the rich against the poor, or of those who have some property against those who have none at all. However, the true use of government for the purposes of the upper or business class seems to be stubbornly ignored by Smith, Ricardo, and even many of today's economists who seem unable or unwilling to take into account present-day events. Even the most committed laissez-faire market economist still expresses the need for government and its legal apparatus to exist as something of a referee to keep the game fair. Terms such as crony capitalism are often used under the assumption that collusion between a governmental constituency and the seemingly detached corporate institutions is of an unethical or criminal nature. Yet again, as noted before, it is illogical to assume that the nature of government is anything else at its core than a vehicle to support the businesses that comprise the wealth of that country. The business apparatus really is the country in technical form, regardless of the surface claim that a democratic country is organized around the interests of the citizenry itself. In fact, it can be well argued that no government in recorded history has ever offered its citizens a legitimate place in governance or legislation and within the context of modern capitalism, which is still a manifestation of centuries-old values and assumptions with a clear elitism in intent. It is interesting how this myth of democracy perpetuates itself today in the way that it does. <clears throat> To further this point, one of the architects of the U.S. Constitution of the United States, James Madison, expressed his concern very clearly regarding the need to oppress the political power of those in the lower classes. <clears throat> he stated, In England at this day, if elections were open to all classes of people, the property of landed proprietors would be insecure. An agrarian law would soon take place. If these observations be just, our government ought to secure the permanent interests of the country against innovation. Landholders ought to have a share in the government to support these invaluable interests and to balance and check the other. They ought to be so constituted as to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. The Senate, therefore, ought to be this body, and to answer these purposes, they ought to have permanency and stability. So starting with this awareness that the very premise of global democracy is deeply inhibited by the capitalist incentive system to competitively maintain power on the level of the state to assist the upper class in preserving political and, by extension, financial power, a clearer picture of how deep this class war runs is obtained. Likely, the most striking aspect of this is how such mechanisms of class division exist in our everyday lives, but yet go unseen, since they are structurally built into the financial, political, and legal apparatus itself. 
class war structural mechanisms. In the modern day, with 40% of the planet's wealth being owned by 1% of the world's population, we find that both in terms of system structure and incentive psychology, powerful mechanisms exist to maintain and even accelerate this grossly disproportionate global wealth imbalance. Needless to say, given the financial basis of everything in the world today, with great wealth comes great power. Hence, as described prior, this power enables a more robust strategy for competitive gain and self-preservation, and consequently, it has hence extended into the very structure of the social system itself, assuring that the upper class has great ease in maintaining their vast wealth security, while the lower classes face enormous structural barriers to attaining any basic level of financial security. Some mechanisms of this class war oppression are fairly obvious. For instance, the debate over taxation and how there has been an historical favoring of the corporate rich over the working poor is one example. The argument of the establishment usually revolves around the idea that since the rich are also the ownership class and are partly responsible for the generation of general employment, they should be given more financial freedom as an aside, it is easy to see that there is very little true merit in this one-sided argument, since the financial oppression through public taxation is actually limiting the purchasing power of the general public, creating an arguably more powerful impediment to economic growth than the mere limiting of the coffers of the corporate employers. The only exceptions to this, which transcends the argument of the rich as job creators, is the advent of plutonomy which will be addressed towards the end of this essay. Class favoring taxation aside, four other more critical structural factors will be discussed. A, debt, B, interest, C, inflation, and D, income disparity. A, debt. Debt is a misunderstood social practice in that most assume debt is an option in society today. In reality, the entire financial system is built out of debt, quite literally. All money is brought into existence through loans in the modern economy, coming from central and commercial banks who essentially create the money out of demand itself. This basic mechanism of monetary creation is a powerful force of economic oppression. Household debt today tends to consist of credit card loans, housing loans, car loans, and student educational loans. Those in the lower classes naturally hold higher levels of this consumer debt than the upper class, since the very nature of being unable to pay outright for basic social staples, such as a car or home, forces the need for bank loans. The result is that the pressure of debt is constant in the lives of the vast majority. The general wage and income rates being what they are on average, naturally as low as possible to assist with the dominant capitalist ethos of cost efficiency upon which the entire society is engineered. The wage income made by the average employee tends to only barely meet the basic loan servicing requirements while in concert with meeting basic, everyday survival needs. Hence, a form of running in place is constant, and the possibility of social mobility up the class hierarchy is deeply impeded, let alone the difficulty of simply getting out of debt itself. <clears throat> B. Interest. Coupled with debt is the profit attribute associated with the sale of money itself. Since the capitalist market economy supports the general commodification of virtually everything, it is no surprise that money itself is sold into existence for profit, and this comes in the form of interest. Whether it is a central bank creating money in exchange for government securities or a commercial bank making a mortgage loan to an average person, interest fees are almost always attached. As mentioned in previous essays, this creates the condition where more debt is generated than actual money in circulation to cover it. 
When a loan is made, only what is termed the principal is produced. The money supply of any country consists of this principal in form, which is the aggregate value of all loans made, money creation. The interest fee, on the other hand, is not in existence. This means that, on the social level, all those taking interest-bearing loans must find money from the pre-existing money supply in order to cover it when paying the loan back. In this process, since all interest paid is being pulled from the principal, it is a mathematical eventuality that certain loans simply cannot be repaid. There simply isn't enough money in the system at any one time. The result is an even more powerful downward class pressure on those holding such basic common loans since there is always this basic scarcity in the money supply itself and everyone working to service their loans have to contend with the inevitable reality that someone is going to fail to meet their loan repayment in the long run. Bankruptcy is a common result in those segments of society that get this short end of the stick. Even more troubling is how the banking mechanism reacts to those who are unable to fulfill their loan obligation. The loan contract and legal system support the power of banks in most cases to repossess the physical property of those who cannot pay. If we think deeply about this ability to repossess, it is arguably an indirect form of theft. If it is inevitable that some will succumb to not meeting their loan repayment due to the inherent scarcity in the money supply with the possible result of the physical property obtained from that loaned money being repossessed by the bank via contractual agreements, then the bank's acquisition of such true physical property is inevitable over time. This means the banks, which are always owned by members of the upper class to be sure, are taking houses, cars, and property of the lower classes, simply because the money they created out of thin air in the form of a loan is not being returned to them. This is, in a sense, a covert form of physical wealth transfer from the lower to the upper class. However, returning to the subject of interest itself, such realities are of little direct concern to the upper class. Given the wealth surplus inherent to their financial status, coupled with the lack of necessity to even take loans most of the time due to this surplus, the scarcity pressure inherent to the money supply due to interest fees always falls on the shoulders of the lower classes. Also, the wealthy are actually further class protected as the phenomenon of investment income via interest earned from large savings accounts, certificates of deposit, and other means turns this vehicle of social oppression for the poor into a vehicle of financial advantage for the rich. <clears throat> C. Inflation. Inflation is generally defined as the rate at which the general level of prices for goods and services is rising and subsequently purchasing power is falling. Unfortunately, this common definition gives no insight into its true causality. While there has been debate as to the true causes of inflation in different economic schools, the quantity theory of money has been proven as the most relevant. In short, this theory simply recognizes that the more money in circulation, the more inflation or rising prices. In other words, all things being equal, if we double the money supply, price levels will also double, etc. The new money dilutes the value of the existing money in a variation of the supply-demand theory of value. The consequence of this is what we could call a hidden tax on people's savings and fixed income rates. For example, let us assume the inflation rate is 3.5% a year. If you have 30000 in 10 years, it will only buy about 21000 worth of goods. While this might appear to have an equal effect for the whole of society, the reality is that it deeply affects the poor much more than the rich when it comes to survival. <clears throat> A person with $3 million in savings is not much hindered by the 3.5% loss of purchasing power. 
However, a person with only 30000 in savings, working to perhaps put a down payment on a home in the future, is deeply affected by this hidden tax. In the context of structural classism, where fixed attributes of the system itself assist in the oppression of the poor and helping of the rich, the mechanism of this hidden tax is also immutably built in. The inherent scarcity in the money supply forces new loans constantly in the economy. Coupled with that is the now globally utilized monetary expansion process known as the fractional reserve lending system. Contrary to popular belief, most loans are not given from a bank's existing deposits. They are invented in real time, limited only by a set percentage of their existing deposits. In short, due to this process over time, it is currently possible that for every 10,000 deposited, about 90,000 can be created from it through the process of ongoing loans and deposits across the entire banking system. This pyramiding of money, coupled with the interest pressure that creates scarcity in the money supply, reveals that the system is inherently inflationary. D. Income differences across society also have both a psychological and structural causality. Psychologically, they are driven in part by the basic profit and cost preservation incentive necessary to remain competitive and functional in the market. In many ways, this incentive could be considered cognitively structural as there is a behavioral threshold that all players in the market economy must adhere when it comes to survival. In turn, this interest of self-preservation, though cost efficiency and maximizing pro through cost efficiency and maximizing profits, while basic to the capitalist game at its core, shows a clear tendency to extend as an overall survival philosophy or human value system in general. In other words, social values become altered by this economic need for constant self-preservation and very often it manifests itself into behavior which in abstraction might be condemned as excessive, selfish, or greedy, when in fact such deemed characteristics are mere extensions or matters of degree with respect to this basic conditioning to stay ahead. Therefore, the overall trend of increasing income inequality in general should not be a surprise. While the United States, with its deeply competitive nature, is a highlight of extreme class inequality today, the trend is still very much a global phenomenon. While the debate about historical trends versus current trends can be made regarding why this period of time, the early 21st century, is showing such extensive increases in the wealth gap, we might conclude that certain structural factors have made their way into the system and these factors are assisting the disparity. We may also conclude that these mechanisms are not anomalies of the system, but rather represent a natural evolution of capitalism through time. For example, the vast income now coming from capital gains is a case in point. While seemingly a minor nuance of general income some economic analysts have deemed capital gains to be the key ingredient of income disparity in the U.S. Capital gains are defined as the amount by which an asset's selling price exceeds its initial purchase price. A realized capital gain is an investment that has been sold at a profit. Its most common context is with respect to the selling of stocks, bonds, derivatives, futures, and other abstract trading vehicles. It has been found that in the United States alone, the top 0.1% of the population earns about half of all capital gains. And such gains account for about 60% of the income of the top 400 richest citizens. The class mechanism of capital gains is interesting because it is a privileged form of income. While the stock market might be used for conservative mutual fund and retirement investment by the general public, it is really an upper class person's game when it comes to substantial returns 
due to the high level of capital initially needed to facilitate such high value returns. Like the elitism of high level interest income, capital gains are a class securing mechanism fueled by pre-existing substantial wealth. Then we have the differences in income with respect to one's position in the corporate hierarchy. In a study performed by the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, it was found that Canada's top CEOs make an average worker's yearly salary in three hours. In the United States, according to research by the Economic Policy Institute, the average annual earnings of the top 1% of wage earners grew 156% from 1979 to 2007. For the top 0.1%, they grew 362%. In contrast, earners in the 90th to 95th percentiles had wage growth of 34% less than a tenth as much as those in the top 0.1% tier. Workers in the bottom 90% had the weakest wage growth at 17% from 1979 to 2007. They continue. The large increase in wage inequality is one of the main drivers of the large upward distribution of household income to the top 1% the others being the rising inequality of capital income and the growing share of income going to capital rather than wages and compensation. The result of these three trends was a more than doubling of the share of total income in the United States received by the top 1% between 1979 and 2007 and a large increase in the income gap between those at the top and the vast majority. In 2007, average annual incomes of the top 1% of households were 42 times greater than incomes of the bottom 90%, up from 14 times greater in 1979, and incomes of the top 0.1% were 220 times greater, up from 47 times greater in 1979. Similar patterns can be found in other industrialized nations. In fact, in 2013, even China has been discussing their growing income gap problem with proposals to ease the disparity. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in a 2011 report found that countries with historically low levels of income inequality have experienced significant increases over the past decade. Causality in the form of clearly defined structural mechanisms are more difficult to pin down with respect to this general trend of employment-related income imbalance. The combination of the psychological incentive of self-preservation and self-maximization inherent to the value system of capitalism coupled with the ever-changing legal, tax, and financial policy-related variables in play, along with the basic strategic edge maintained by the upper classes due to their existing wealth security, creates a complex, synergistic mechanism of class preservation and external oppression. A subtle yet revealing statistical point to also note is how during recent recessions in the United States, the wealth gap has actually widened. It is axiomatic to conclude that if the system of, eco of economy was without structural interference in favor of the wealthy, a national recession on the scale of what occurred from 2007 onward should have affected most everyone negatively, regardless of social class. Yet it was reported in 2010 that the wealthiest 5% of Americans who earn more than 180% who earn more than 180,000 added slightly to their annual incomes last year. Families at the 50,000 median level slipped lower. As a final point on the issue of income inequality, it is important to note how national economic growth often relates to those of the upper class itself reducing the general economic relevance of the lower classes. The term plutonomy is appropriate in this case. A plutonomy is defined as economic growth that is powered and consumed by the wealthiest upper class of society. Plutonomy refers to a society where the majority of the wealth is controlled by an ever-shrinking minority 
As such, the economic growth of that society becomes dependent on the fortunes of that same wealthy minority. Perhaps the best way to describe the nature of plutonomy and its relevance to the modern day is to consider the words of those who embrace it. In 2005, Citigroup, a powerful global banking institution, produced a series of internal memos on the subject and it was quite candid in its analysis and conclusions. They stated, the world is dividing into two blocks, the plutonomy and the rest. The US, UK, and Canada are the key plutonomies, economies powered by the wealthy. In a plutonomy, there is no such animal as the US consumer or the UK consumer, or indeed the Russian consumer. There are rich consumers, few in number, but disproportionate in the gigantic slice of income and consumption they take. There are the rest, the non-rich, the multitudinous many, but only accounting for surprisingly small bites of the national pie. We should worry less about what the average consumer, say the 50th percentile, is going to do, when that consumer is, we think, less relevant to the aggregate data than how the wealthy feel and what they are doing. This is simply a case of mathematics, not morality. With 20% of the American population controlling 85% of the country's wealth, it is clear that those utilizing that 85% are more important to the GDP or growth of the economy. What this means is that the financial system has little incentive to care about the actions or financial well-being of most of the public. It continues. The heart of our plutonomy thesis is that the rich are the dominant source of income, wealth, and demand in plutonomy countries such as the UK, US, Canada, and Australia. Secondly, we believe that the rich are going to keep getting richer in coming years. As capitalists, the rich get an even bigger share of GDP as a result, principally of globalization. We expect the global pool of labor in developing economies to keep wage inflation in check and profit margins rising, good for the wealth of capitalists, relatively bad for developed market unskilled outsourceable labor. This bodes well for companies selling to or servicing the rich. With respect to the relevance of the rest of the population, the memo states, we see the biggest threat to plutonomy as coming from a rise in political demands to reduce income inequality, spread the wealth more evenly, and challenge forces such as globalization, which have benefited profit and wealth growth. Our conclusion, the three levers governments and societies could pull on to end plutonomy are benign. Property rights are generally still intact taxation policies neutral to favorable, and globalization is keeping the supply of labor in surplus, acting as a break on wage inflation. While plutonomy itself might not exactly be a source of class conflict, it is certainly as a result. Christia Freeland, author of Plutocrats, The Rise of the New Global Super Rich and the Fall of Everyone Else, makes a point about the nature of this frame psychology inherent to those of the opulent minority. You don't do this in a kind of chortling, smoking your cigar, conspiratorial thinking way. You do it by persuading yourself that what is in your own personal self-interest is in the interests of everybody else. So you persuade yourself that actually government services, things like spending on education, which is what created that social mobility in the first place, need to be cut so that the deficit will shrink, so that your tax bill doesn't go up. And what I really worry about is there is so much money and so much power at the very top and the gap between those people at the very top and everybody else is so great that we are going to see social mobility choked off and society transformed. In conclusion, a great deal more could be said with respect to the multi-level battling occurring on the planet Earth, mostly centric to financial and market power and its institutional preservation. 
From physical violence to subtle legal manipulation, the theme is consistent and dominant. It could even be argued that progress itself has war waged against it since established corporate institutions who maintain powerful market share in a given industry will often work to ruthlessly shut down anything that can compete with them, even if the product is progressively better or more sustainable in utility. Change and progress itself in real terms are not readily welcomed in the capitalist system as it often disturbs the success of established institutions. The incredibly slow rate of application of new sustainability improving technological methods is a case in point. In fact, on the corporate level, there is not only a perpetual war to reduce such competition, but there is also the ongoing exploitation of the public in general. Adam Smith actually made this point in his The Wealth of Nations, stating, The interest of the dealers, however, in any particular branch of trade or manufacturers is always in some respects different from and even opposite to that of the public. To narrow the competition is always the interest of dealers, but to narrow the competition can serve only to enable the dealers by raising their profits above what they naturally would be to levy for their own benefit an absurd tax upon the rest of their fellow citizens. On the national level, peace today seems to be merely a pause between conflicts on the stage of global civilization there is a war going on somewhere virtually all the time, and when there isn't, the major powers are busy building more advanced weapons and or selling off the old ones to other countries who are posturing in the same way, all under the name of not only protection, but in the name of good business as well. Even nations themselves have taken on a form of class hierarchy with dominant first world nations subjugating poor third world nations. Common gradient terms such as superpowers, powers, subpowers, and vassal states can be found in historical literature with respect to the national class hierarchy and the structural mechanisms which keep this gradient in form are not very different in intent than what keeps the social classes in order. For example, while the debt and interest systems as described do very well to keep downward pressure on the lower classes, structurally limiting prosperity and social mobility, the same effect occurs to repress a nation via the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. Even John Adams, the second president of the United States, pointed this out with his statement, there are two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by the sword, the other is by debt. <clears throat> On the broadest scale, the real war being waged is on problem resolution and human harmony. The real war is on a balance of power and social justice. The real war, in effect, is on the institution of economic equality. In the words of former Supreme Court Justice Louis D. Brandeis, we can have democracy in this country or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. All across the world today, people talk about the need for equality. Most literate people in the world have no respect for gender or racial bias. The idea of being sexist or racist has become a deeply abhorred view, even though it was not that long ago in the Western world such cultural views were considered normal. <clears throat> there appears to be a course of evolution that wishes to equalize society, that is, by definition, what the underlying gesture of democracy is supposed to denote. Yet in the midst of all this, the most oppressive form of segregated human suffering continues largely unnoticed in its true context. Today is not race, gender, or creed that keeps one most oppressed. It is the institution of class. It is now an issue of rich and poor, and like racism, these ideological and ultimately structural forms of oppression discriminate and divide the human species in deeply powerful and destructive ways. In the broad view, this theater of multidimensional warfare, truly a world at war with itself, is wholly unsustainable. It is becoming more and more clear, given the accelerating social problems at hand, that the ethos of all-out competition and narrow self-preservation at the expense of others 
whether on the personal, corporate, class, ideological, or national level, will not be the source of any resolution or long-term human prosperity. It is going to take a new type of thinking to overcome these sociological trends and at the heart of such dramatic cultural change rests the change of the socio-economic premise itself.